Um, Dr. Gardy is also an occasional host of CBC's The Nature of Things, so let's have a warm round of applause for Dr. Gardy. Don't clap yet, this could be terrible. The, the musicians wrote their music in two days. I wrote this talk in 20 minutes. So well, <laughs> that's the academic way, do it at the last minute. Uh, so as Kaylee mentioned, uh, I do do a bit of science television. If I look familiar, it might be from the nature of things. They let me host it once or twice a season. I guess it's when they put David Suzuki back in his like cryopreservation chamber. <laughs> Whatever they do to keep him going, like he's 80, he should have retired, it should be my show by now. <laughs> he just keeps going. Uh, I did Daily Planet for a long time too. I was there for many years as a Zaya Tong's uh, fill-in when she was on assignment uh, or on vacation. You might also just recognize me from the bar around. Uh, if I'm not doing science, I'm usually drinking fermentation science. So hello to everyone. It's a pleasure to combine talking about science, drinking about science, uh, and joining you all on stage at the Fox, which my parents are probably really mortified about. <laughs> They're like, Gardy, this is why you were supposed to stay in school, so you're not on stage at the porn theater. <laughs> But as Kaylee mentioned, uh, in addition to talking about science on television and drinking and talking about science, uh, one of the things I do is actual science. I have a real scientific job, uh, senior scientist at BCCDC, assistant professor at uh, School of Population and Public Health, where Kaylee lives at UBC, woot for SPPH. Um, but yeah, I work. Here at BCCDC, this is it, lovingly rendered in watercolor, relaxing, soothing. Um, how many of you actually knew we had a CDC? Yeah. Yay, some hands and some woots. That's excellent. Infectious disease never gets woots. Uh, it, like, you know, curing childhood cancer, that always gets woots. Yeah, yeah, kid, make, make the kids healthy again. But infectious disease, nobody's ever like, herpes, woo, yay. <laughs> But they should be, because it's interesting. So uh, for those of you who didn't know, those of you who neither put their hand up nor wooted, uh, this is CDC. We have an entire building full of people whose job is to keep you safe from whatever's out there. Um, this week, it's beaver fever, believe it or not. Uh, <laughs> I got the email in my box this morning, uh, la <laughs> last week. <laughs> and I realized I just said the words beaver and box. <laughs> in really close proximity to each other on the stage of the Fox. So I'm just killing it in the STI uh, potential division here. So we do a lot of stuff, you know, last week was accidental mushroom poisoning. It's basically kind of whatever is making you weak this week. Um, but this is us at CDC. And at CDC, uh, as Kaylee mentioned, I do this. I do something that is called genomic epidemiology. And genomic epidemiology is essentially reading the whole genome sequences of pathogens taken from an outbreak situation to figure out what happened in that outbreak. So so if we've got a bunch of cases of tuberculosis, we've bought, got a bunch of cases of measles virus, we'll sequence all those mycobacterium tuberculosis genomes, we'll sequence all those measles virus genomes, and we'll look for clues, we'll look for little signals in those genomes that will tell us exactly who infected who in that outbreak. And this was a technique that wasn't possible until about five years ago when DNA sequencing uh, technology really kind of changed for the better. Our group was the one that really kind of pioneered it. I peaked early in my scientific career with like a New England Journal article in 2011 introducing this technique to the world. Uh, it's something that public health uh, agencies all over the world, CDC in Atlanta, um, Public Health England, Public Health Agency of Canada, they've all kind of picked this up and they're all doing it to investigate outbreaks. It's basically changed the way we do infectious disease control. It's totally revolutionary. I get to talk to Bill Gates about it in a couple of weeks, which is super exciting. And I'm not actually going to talk about it this evening. I talk about this all the time. Like, this is my bread and butter. This is what I do every day. It's actually really not that interesting. <laughs> what is interesting to me 
as a public health professional, as somebody who stays up at night, you know, worrying about infectious diseases, the thing that really keeps me uh, up at night and wondering, the thing that I want to talk to you today uh, about, something that's really serious, is this. What the fuck are we gonna do when the zombie apocalypse happens? I know there are people in the audience who have thought this through. <laughs> This is nerd night, like this is the perfect demographic for this. How many of you at some point in your life have given some thought to what your zombie apocalypse preparedness plan is? Exactly, way more people than have heard of CDC. <laughs> this is okay, I'm not offended by it. By the way, we are located at 655 West 12th Avenue. In the event of a zombie apocalypse, you may wish to knock on our back door. Uh, Zombies are awesome. I love zombies. Anybody that's interested in uh, any sort of doomsday scenario, anything infectious disease, thinks zombies are fascinating. And I also like zombies because of their science communication potential. It is science literacy week this week. I do loads of science communication stuff. And zombies are an extremely effective science communication tool. Uh, CDC in Atlanta, the CDC mothership, uh, they famously got people to give a shit about public health emergency preparedness, which is like the least interesting part of public health. Like, public health is full of good stuff. There's, you know, Ebola, there's flesh eating disease, there's, there's accidental mushroom poisonings in BC, but nobody cares about emergency preparedness. Nobody's like, oh, I better check my water stocks and make sure I have enough canned food to survive the apocalypse. But CDC actually got people thinking about this when a few years ago, they did a zombie campaign. They said, okay, what if there were a zombie apocalypse? What would you do? Are you prepared? And people really got into it to the point where when it still existed, you could go to CDC's gift shop. It no longer exists, to my great disappointment, and you could buy a CDC zombie preparedness t-shirt with the little logo. All you can buy now is coffee mugs uh, and onesies for babies, which is kind of weird. <laughs> I did actually get one for my neighbor's baby. She works in public health, too. So I was like, look, this is a perfect accoutrement for your future disease controller. <laughs> you probably actually, if you get a CDC onesie, you're probably obliged to send any sort of fecal material that ends up in the onesie to CDC for analysis. This may just be some sort of clever tool that they're using for molecular surveillance. I don't know. But zombie is effective science communication tool. You take any concept in public health, if you explain it in terms of you know, something boring like amoebic dysentery, nobody is going to listen. You explain it in terms of you know, walking hordes of the undead, and suddenly people pay attention. So what I thought I would do tonight is uh, just walk you quickly through three vignettes of things that we do in public health that we would do in a zombie apocalypse. So what the fuck are we going to do? First thing is answer the question, what the fuck is this thing? If you've got a zombie outbreak on your hands, obviously the first question that you want to answer is what is the agent that is responsible for this? This is going to help you design you know, therapeutics, vaccines, a cure, you name it. So if you look in nature, you'll find actually a fair number of examples of, of zombieism. You'll find all sorts of parasites, all sorts of fungi that will sort of take over their host and zombify it. If you are a frequent nerd nighter, Kaylee has spoken about this before, it's always parasites and fungi that do this. But if you look in the, the zombie canon uh, in terms of movies, in terms of television, novels and things, it's not parasites, it's not fungi, it's always a virus that's causing the zombie outbreak. And this makes sense because viruses move quickly. You know, you watch a show like The Walking Dead, somebody gets bit, in a couple hours they've got a fever, a few hours after that they've turned. Viruses work on that sort of speedy scale. So the first thing we would have to answer is what virus is causing this outbreak? And that question of what novel virus has suddenly appeared in our population is something that we as public health deal with on a fairly regular basis. It's not an everyday basis, fortunately, but it's a regular basis. Every couple of years we encounter a new threat. 
SARS. Uh, many of you were probably around for SARS in 2003 in British Columbia. It was an infectious disease that emerged out of Asia and reached our shores and hit Toronto really hard. Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS, also caused by a coronavirus. Um, Zika is not really an emerging disease. It's been around since 1947, but we're just kind of understanding it for the first time. Uh, Nipah virus about 15 years ago. Nipah virus was actually the inspiration for one of my favorite scary disease movies. I actually got into infectious diseases. It's really embarrassing. I saw Outbreak, which is a horrible film. <laughs> It is a horrible film. Do not pick your career based on a Dustin Hoffman movie like I did. <laughs> it turned out okay for me, but Contagion did a much better job. They had a very good consulting virologist, and they used uh, the story, the emergence of Nipah virus, which came out in Malaysia about 15 years ago uh, as the inspiration for the virus. I love this movie because Gwyneth Paltrow dies. <laughs> <laughs> Though it should be pointed out, not unlike her movie career, it is not, she doesn't die until she's sort of unleashed this horrible pox upon the world. <laughs> the same could be said for her lifestyle blog and her scientific advice. And yeah, her weird, uh, yeah, her colon spa. Did anybody see the colon spa or the vagina spa? You could steam yourself to better health. Don't listen to Gwyneth. She's a terrible person. <laughs> if you get to the end of the movie, if you didn't, you know, just sort of rewind Gwyneth's death scene over and over again, and you actually made it to the end of the film, you would have seen uh, how a virus jumped from a bat to a pig uh, to humans and via Gwyneth Paltrow to the entire universe. Uh, and that's really the story of how Nipah virus spilled over. So when we see uh, a novel virus like Nipah, like SARS, what do we do? How do we figure out what it is? In the past, it used to be kind of a two-step process. And the first step was to isolate the virus. We would have to get tissue from somebody that was sick, and we would physically actually have to look for the virus. Typically using microscopy, we would find it, we would isolate it, we would grow it up in a dish, we would culture it. Uh, and then after we'd cultured it, we'd break it apart, pull out all the DNA, sequence the genome, and figure out you know, what makes this thing tick. These days, we can skip over that first step and we can basically get to uh, the story of a new virus immediately, thanks to metagenomics. Metagenomics is probably the only scientific technique that you can explain with a hyperbole and a half meme. Metagenomics is sequencing all the things. I guess you have to go sequence all the things like that. Yeah, Kaylee is doing metagenomics. She is sequencing all the things that come out of rats. So what you do with metagenomics, it's fairly straightforward. You take an environmental sample. It could be you know, a cup of water from the ocean. It could be rat feces that you've harvested from Kaylee's dumpster. It could be the blood sample from, I'm sorry I referred to you as your dumpster. It's, your, it's really the people's dumpster, I suppose and the people's rats. So you, har you, you pick an environment, you break apart all the cells in that environment, you pull out the DNA from all of those cells, and you read what's in there. So if you were you know, harvesting the feces of one of Kaylee's rats, you would probably get some rat DNA, you would get all sorts of bacterial DNA from whatever's in the rat's colon, you might get some DNA from whatever foodstuffs the rat had been eating, you know, like 7-Eleven hot dog DNA or something, and by comparing all of the sequences that you get against a database, you can identify like, oh, okay, well, you know, this sample is 99% rat, there's, you know, 0.5% 7-Eleven hot dog, there's 0.2% E. coli, you get a list of what's in there. So when we're doing metagenomics to find a new virus, what we would do is take a sample from our patient, it might be blood, it might be cerebrospinal fluid, we break open all the cells, we sequence all the DNA, we throw up 
the human stuff, because we know that's coming from our patient. We throw out the stuff from the bacteria and the viruses that we would expect to find there, your sort of regular flora, your microbiome. And we just look for what's left over. We look where what's interesting, what's a pathogen, what's not supposed to be there, what's something that we've never seen before and doesn't have a match to anything else in the database. And that's how we start to figure out what this new agent might be. A great example of this, a couple of years ago, it didn't pan out, unfortunately. The headlines had so much promise for the end of days. Uh, <laughs> new virus in Africa, looks like rabies, acts like Ebola. If you had to pick the two scariest pathogens in the world, they'd probably be rabies number one and Ebola number two. So imagine my excitement as a disease controller when I... <laughs> turn on the news and everybody's like, oh, well, rabies Ebola. So you're like, oh, great, this is my time to shine. Uh, <laughs> and it turns out when you're a really terrifying pathogen like rabies Ebola, you can't actually spread very far before everything just kind of goes up in flames. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, 2009, there were a couple of very weird cases of what looked like Ebola but didn't test positive for Ebola in the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And so scientists that were interested in figuring out what is this, is this some sort of new interesting hemorrhagic fever, did this metagenomics approach. They took samples from the patients that had gotten sick, sequenced all of the DNA that was in there, threw out the human DNA, threw out the regular stuff that you'd expect to be there, and what they found was uh, a virus that looked like rabies, its closest relative in the database was rabies, but it caused a syndrome that looked like Ebola. So this sort of metagenomics technique, we've used this time and time again to discover novel pathogens. If there were a zombie outbreak, this is probably the first first thing we would do. We would grab some sort of <laughs> string of rotting flesh from a zombie that happened to be shuffling past. We'd wear gloves, of course. We're very safety conscious at CDC. <laughs> We'd grab a string of rotting flesh, pulverize it, sequence everything that we found in there, throw out the human DNA, and look for what was left over. And that would help us find out you know, what the fuck this thing actually is. Having answered that question, the next question is HTF. How the fuck is this thing spreading? And it's here that we go from uh, the lab to the math domain, uh, and we encounter what's probably one of the most fundamental concepts in uh, epidemiology today. So fundamental, it actually made it into contagion, too. Uh, this is something called r naught, or the basic reproductive ratio. And r naught's a very simple uh, concept. It says for every one person who is sick, how many secondary infections will they cause? If you have a completely susceptible population, how many other people will get sick as a result of this one person's infection? There is a lot of math that goes into r naught. I will just summarize it as this. I will summarize it with words instead of terrifying math shapes. Uh, <laughs> words are this. It's okay. I'll give you terrifying math shapes later. I'm just going to ease you in right now. Um, you can get another drink before we get to the terrifying math shapes. Uh, r naught is simply a function of three things, the transmissibility of a pathogen, so uh, you know, how infectious is it? Do I have to cough a lot of it onto you? Can I just cough a little onto you to make you sick? Uh, I, incidentally, if you come say hi after, I have a cold right now, uh, so don't get too close. Stay in the zone of exclusion, and if I don't shake your hand, uh, that's okay. I can CDC elbow bump. The, the, properly endorsed way of greeting somebody when you're sick. So transmissibility, it's true. Uh, in, during the uh, swine flu pandemic, you actually saw political leaders, including Obama, doing the elbow bump, which is really cool. Yay, public health. Um, so <laughs> transmissibility, how transmissible is the pathogen, how likely it is to make others sick. We have to also consider this in terms of the contact rate. A pathogen can be extremely transmissible, but if you're if your population, if your people aren't coming into contact with each other, if they're not, you know, sitting overstuffed into a crowded old porn theater, uh, your pathogen isn't going to get anywhere. If you have a pathogen that's not very transmissible, but you have conditions like this, suddenly the uh, opportunities for transmission increase somewhat. Uh, and you also have to consider duration of infection. How long is somebody sick for? The longer they are, the more contacts they'll make, the more chance they have to pass things on. So when we calculate R0, we get a number. 
out. We get a simple number, and if that number is greater than one, the epidemic can sustain itself. The disease can keep transmitting in your population. If the R0 is less than one, it's just going to peter out at some point. And if you have a population that uh, isn't entirely susceptible um, because they've been immunized, they've been vaccinated, uh, it's easier to get your R0 below one. We can also, with our R0 value, calculate another important parameter. If we do, this is, this is probably as mathy as it's going to get. If we do 1 minus 1 over R0, there's my air math for you, um, that tells us the proportion of the population that needs to be immune to something in order to affect herd immunity. This is something we hear a lot about these days, thanks to uh, vaccination and refusers. And depending on the R0, you're going to get different values for 1 minus 1 over R0. If you've got something like the flu, its R0 is typically kind of 1.2 to maybe at the most 1.5. So only about two-thirds of your population needs to be immune, either through natural exposure or through vaccination, in order to really keep flu from spreading through your population. If you have something like measles, which has the highest R0 on record, uh, R0 estimates vary from outbreak to outbreak, but for measles, the highest that's been reported is 20. So if you do 1 minus 1 over 20, you get 0.95. 95% of the population needs to be immune against measles in order to affect herd immunity, which is why measles is coming back. So, the first thing that we would do in a zombie apocalypse, besides throw all the anti-vaxxers to the zombies first, <laughs> as a line of defense, would be to calculate R0 and figure out how much of a bad time we were actually in for. The third thing that we would want to answer, this is probably the most important thing, is what the fuck can we do about this? Like, oh, so there's a terrible rabies Ebola virus on the loose. So it's R0 is, you know, 10, and we're all going to die. What can we do? And to this, again, we turn to math. We turn to math modeling. This... <laughs> I'm so sorry for this. I can't help but make horrible puns, and when I can do them visually, it's even worse, because you get that moment, it's almost like a paper cut, where you know you cut yourself, and you're like, oh, that's really gonna hurt in a second, and you put this slide up, and you're like, oh, that's gonna be terrible in a second, and then people are like, that joke is awful. Um, so thank you for not throwing anything. So math modeling. Uh, this actually, if you're curious, uh, that is one of the equations that you use to figure out from uh, parameters that you can collect really early in an outbreak, things like the number of cases, how long it's been. That's the math that you use to actually calculate R0. This is probably the first time that type of math has ever appeared on stage at the Fox before. <laughs> it's really cool. I don't remember that from Deep Throat. I don't think that was in there. So. Math modeling actually has an illustrious history. It goes much further back than Deep Throat. Uh, it goes back to Bernoulli. Uh, Bernoulli, who is, of course, gave rise to the Bernoulli principle, which is why we can all fly around in airplanes. Thank you, fluid dynamics. Um, Bernoulli was the first person to do infectious disease math modeling. And back in the days when smallpox inoculation, uh, as espoused by Edward Jenner, was sort of coming on the scene, uh, Bernoulli calculated that the effect of smallpox inoculation on population life expectancy was to increase life expectancy from 26 <laughs> uh, to 29. So kind of rock star style, like I hope I die before I get old. That was just how things rolled uh, back in the smallpox era. But Bernoulli was really the first to actually show that, yes, you can use math to make important health decisions and rationalize things. And so we use math to this day uh, in making public health decisions. We use compartmental modeling. Compartmental modeling is actually pretty straightforward. Compartmental modeling is compartments. Uh, it, you're not supposed to put people in boxes, but in compartmental modeling, that's exactly what we do. We put people in boxes. In the easiest form of com uh, compartmental modeling in an epidemiological context, we do something called SIR modeling, susceptible, infected, recovered. And I've put an asterisk by recovered. Asterisk is very hard to pronounce, too, by the way. Um, 
Recovered is sometimes termed removed because you can be infected and you can recover or you can be infected and you can be removed from the epidemic, which is a very polite way of saying you've died. <laughs> Math is a, it's very graceful terminology. I'm so sorry, they've been removed. Um, <laughs> We should use that more often. So compartmental modeling, you've got your S box, you've got your I box, and you've got your R box. So for a given population, we might be modeling the entire population of Vancouver, all of BC. We might be modeling just the population of those of us here in the room. All of us are going to fit into one of these compartments with respect to a particular disease. So, uh, you know, if it's the, the common cold, some of us are susceptible at the moment, some of us, me, are infected at the moment, and then some of us have recovered because we have recently had a cold. 